All right, let's take our chorus books and turn to number four. I woke up this morning early and the Lord had this song in my mind and heart. I was singing it and thought it would be a good one to begin with today. Jesus Christ is made to me all I need. Jesus Christ is made to me, all I need, all I need. He alone is all my plea, he is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure. He is all I need. Jesus is my all in all. All I need, all I need. While he keeps, I cannot fall. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power. Holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. He redeemed me when He died, all I need, all I need. I with Him was crucified, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, Holiness forevermore, my redemption full and sure, He is all I need. He's the treasure of my soul, all I need, all I need. He hath cleansed and made me whole, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. Glory, glory to the Lamb, all I need, all I need. By His Spirit sealed I am. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. And let's sing number five, and we'll get to our study. He's the Savior of my soul. He's the Savior of my soul, Jesus, my Lord. He's the Savior of my soul. He's the Savior of my soul, Jesus, Savior, Master, Redeemer. He's the Savior of my soul. He's the Savior of my soul. All right, well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Psalm 147. My text today is taken from verse 7 down through verse 11. And you'll see in this psalm there are actually three different sections. We saw the first Last time, verses 1 through 6, where it begins with, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. And then 
verse 7 begins again, sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. So this is the second section that we're going to look at today from verse 7 down to verse 11. And then the third will be next time in verse 12. Praise ye the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. So the whole theme here is praise unto God. And this study I've entitled How God Rules the World. It describes this here in this portion. Sing unto the Lord, verse 7, with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God, who covereth the heaven with the clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at these verses together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, even as we read your word, I pray that you would make us mindful of who you are. We live in a world that does not know you, and that because of the depravity of these hearts. And if any of us do know you, all the praise, honor, and glory belongs unto you. By your spirit, we would not even know how to approach unto you, except that you have taught us through this word and by your spirit and opened our otherwise blind eyes that we might see and behold your glory and approach unto you in the only way that any sinner can approach and have acceptance. And that is through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that work that he came and earned and established and you imputed there at the cross upon completion of his working out that righteousness. Oh, what a great, blessed righteousness that is. But I'm thankful that we find here in the word your great glory, even as we saw last time, our great God, your great glory in how you rule this world. And for those of us that are your children, this is a great comfort because we look around us and we see nothing but trouble and turmoil. We look within us you know, in this flesh, and we see nothing but trouble and turmoil. So how can it be that you could be a just God and yet at the same time a Savior? Well, I'm thankful again that this is your world and that you are directing all things according to your will and pleasure and purpose. And may you grant us faith to see your hand in all things. And for that, we will... Be mindful to give you all the praise and honor and glory through the name of your dear Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Whose world is this? Now, if you were to go out and ask people in the world, you would get a number of different answers. There are those that believe that this world belongs to humankind. In other words, God created it, set the laws in motion, and put in order governments and even from the Bible, civic laws and rules and regulations. And so this is how the world is governed by men. In fact, and I'm, I will tell you, I believe in our constitution, but when you go back and study our founding fathers, they were what we would know as deists. In fact, those off-cited words from our Declaration of Independence are these. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And here's the key part, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's a Christian statement. It really isn't. What they're saying is we're declaring this independence based on 
God giving us here on earth the rule. We have to rule justly and rightly, but we rule. And that's what the significance is there when you go back and look what they believed. Some of you may know about Thomas Jefferson's Bible. It's in the Smithsonian uh, Institution. It has scriptures ripped out, torn out, because he didn't believe in anything that had to do with supernatural or miracles, anything of that sort he took out. He approached everything from what he said was the wisdom God gave us. And it's not by revelation, it's by intellect. And that's one of our founding fathers of this country. Did God so purpose? Yes. But it's not surprising that as we go around, there are a lot of people that view the world from that perspective, and even will take the scriptures to support it by saying, don't bother God. God has created the world. He set it in motion. The laws are there. And a lot of this came out of what they call the age of enlightenment, where people started looking at human wisdom. So at the base of it is humanism. That's what that word means. It shouldn't surprise us that there are many that hold that view and believe it. They're humanists. Others that you talk to, when you ask this question, whose world is this? They will tell you without hesitation, this is Satan's world. That's how they view it. That when God cast out Satan from heaven, this became his world. And they interpret him where it says that he's the prince of this world to mean that this is his domain and that God sent his son into the world to attempt to get men and women un out from under Sa uh, Satan's dominion to trust in his son if they just will. And that now that he has done all he can, have you ever heard that expression before? Christ couldn't give any more than he gave. But now it's up to you to see that he's the only one that can deliver. But until you make your decision, until you make your choice, you continue under that dominion. Now, interestingly, at some point, they believe that Christ is going to step back in and put an end to it all. <laughs> and the clock is ticking, so we have to rescue as many as possible. Now, what is the one common denominator between the two things I've just told you about? It's humanism. It doesn't matter whether you say, well, men in charge of the world in governments or whether Satan is, in both cases, it's up to man. I ask you, is that the God of the Bible? It's not the God of the Bible. What a different picture we have here of God as he sets himself forth in the scriptures. And who would you rather believe, God or man? Quit reading all these testimonial books about what man did or what so-and-so did and how they turned their life around. We want to read the testimony of God. And that's what we see here in this hymn. This entire scripture does one thing. It gives all the glory, praise, and honor to God alone. And if that's not the view that a person has of who God is as supreme ruler, then they're blind. That's all you can say. They're still blind. So that's why I want to talk to you about how God rules his world. And this, I trust, will be a help to all of us as we live day in and day out because the world's spinning. And as it spins, it's a fallen world. But even that God has purpose. Times, seasons, changes. God is either God or he isn't. He either rules in every detail or he doesn't. And if he doesn't, then certainly he's not worthy of worship. He's not worthy of praise. But if he does, then it is idolatry to give praise, honor, and glory to any other but to this God. God is the God of this world. In fact, over there in Corinthians, you've heard me preach that before, where 
Paul said that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of men. And of course, most people interpret that to mean Satan. Ah, he's the God of this world. Thankfully, Satan isn't the God of this world. He's called the prince of this world in that, in that he has his dominion over men's hearts and minds. But even there, Christ said, now is the prince of this world cast out. Christ didn't come by his life and death to make an attempt at taking back the world. No, he came into this world and cast out Satan. That's where back there in Genesis 3.15, God said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That took place at Calvary. The head's where the venom is. And Christ so satisfied law and justice by his life and his death, that Satan can no longer reign over those for whom Christ paid the debt. That's who he came to save. He came to take out of Satan's dominion, not attempt to. This wasn't a failed rescue attempt. He came and accomplished all that was necessary so that Satan has no dominion over those for whom Christ laid down his life. Now, he is given dominion over the rest. They're blinded. And under his dominion, but not the Lord's. So God is the God of this world. And he is sovereign over all his creation. And he directs all things according to his good pleasure. The good pleasure of his will. So is that the God you know? Certainly that's the God of scripture. So let's look at these together, how God rules his world. First, God rules his world as the supreme magistrate. Here, you'll notice in verse 7, two different words used for God. And we've looked at this before, but since it's here, we're coming back to it. Sing unto the Lord. And you notice capital L-O-R-D. That's what I appreciate about the translators here. That's the word Jehovah God. And so this is addressed to those that are his people by covenant relationship. This is the name that God told Moses, when you go to the children of Israel and they ask, who has sent me? You tell them, I am has sent, sent you. I am. Jehovah. That name, capital L-O-R-D, is reserved just for God's chosen people in the world. This isn't just a general command given to everybody. Well, sing to the Lord. Who is it that truly can sing to the Lord? It's those that he has chosen, that he's redeemed, and in whom he has put his spirit that they might know him in, in truth. And so he is the supreme magistrate when it comes to his people. We sing to the Lord. In other words, all the honor and glory belong unto him. To me, that's how you can tell that the Lord has taught a sinner by his spirit. Who gets the glory? It's not that complicated. You don't have to listen a long time to figure out who's the Lord's and who isn't. You can't give God too much glory. They're not saying, well, God saved me, but I had to first take the first step. No. <laughs> Sing to the Lord, the covenant God, the one who did the choosing. They're not going around saying like so many today that profess to be Christian that Christ died there on the cross, but I had to believe on him in order to make that effectual for me. Have you ever heard that expression, you have to appropriate his death to you? I ask you, if you're dead in your sin, how on earth can you appropriate anything? Now, this work was done for God's people even before they were born in this world, since the cross. And by his spirit of grace, they just find out about it. That's what the spirit does. He goes and reveals Christ in the heart of each one that God the Father in this covenant from eternity purpose to save and for whom Christ came and paid the debt. People talk about getting saved when 
they've made some sort of decision. You don't get saved. God saves. It's not like got milk. No, you don't get saved. It's God in his grace through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, revealing Christ in those hearts. That's who this covenant God is. And the beauty is that he can't mess up. He is going to have everyone that he's purposed to save for, Christ, for, who, for whom Christ paid the debt. And when I preach the gospel, I'm not trying to get anybody saved. I'm just declaring the, new, the good news of this God of the Bible who rules the world as supreme magistrate. And God does the work. God directs that seed where he will. You know, if he wasn't the ruler of this world, how would he direct the seed? Think about that. If he's up there wringing his hands and hoping that everybody gets busy and even put it back under the form of it's up to us that we have this responsibility now given us by God. Don't bother him. Just get out and do the work. You could work all day long and it would never bring one convert to Christ. It's not in the sowing of the seed. It's not in the preaching. It's in God being pleased by his word to bring that word home to each one for whom he paid the debt. That's why last time in verse four, it's such a blessing. If he tells the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. If he knows the stars by their names, he certainly knows those that are his. Someone mentioned this past week that when God took Abraham out under the night sky and showed him the stars of the heaven as to how this promise would be fulfilled in that seed that should come from him. We don't know who they are. We know the seed was Christ, but we don't. That's a number the scriptures say that no man can number. I don't know. I just know that when it's all said and done, there's going to be a throng around that throne of glory doing one thing, singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. I'll tell you, any not giving him all the glory here can't be expected to be there giving the glory. It's not going to be like all of a sudden there's going to be a chain. No, he converts the hearts here by his spirit and causes them to praise them here as long as they have breath. Even down to the thief on the cross, he was God's chosen from all eternity. He didn't know it. In fact, he spent his lifetime robbing, stealing, and killing, and that's why he got capital punishment. And right up to the end, he was blaspheming Christ along with his partner over there, both of them mocking the Lord. But suddenly, there was a change. That was the Spirit of God causing his heart to be turned to Christ and see this one as his savior and redeemer and king. That's why he cried out, remember me when you come in your kingdom. <laughs> there was nothing visible to look at to even see a king, but the spirit showed him that this one was paying his debt. And he entered into glory. Christ said, today you shall be with me in paradise. He entered into glory, not on his own, merits, but on the merit of Christ and his death and what he would accomplish. And so that's how God rules the world. And he is thankworthy. That's what the word there says. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. And if it really is a cooperation between God and the sinner, they'd have to thank both. And sadly, that's what preachers do. Oh, I thank you for coming. Whenever guests show up, I'm, I'm thank you, thank you for coming. I appreciate you making that decision for for Jesus. That's that's not it. He alone is thankworthy in all things pertaining to our salvation. But then you notice here the second part of verse seven: two names for God, the Lord, capital L O R D, is the covenant God in grace and mercy in Christ. But then it says, "Sing praise on." Now, upon the harp unto our God. The harp was a stringed instrument. Today we have the organ or the piano. These are what God has purposed to accompany our music. But accompany is the word. We're not enthralled with the harp. The important thing here is sing praise 
as you do upon the harp, but unto our God. That's what true, true praise is. And that word God is the same word that we would use of a chief magistrate, the supreme chief magistrate and judge. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God then rules his world. How does he rule his world? That's what we're looking at. He rules his world as God. If there were any aspect of his rule that did not come from him, he would not be God, nor would he be praiseworthy. You notice here, praise is an italic, but it's insinuated in the word sing. To sing is to praise, just like the birds chirp. He causes them to sing to his praise. One of the nice things I like, and it's been a long time about getting out into nature and even camping out, is just to stop and listen to the sounds of creation. I say the sounds of creation, but it's God working through the birds and uh, the animals. We had some friends come out and visit us one time in Africa, and there was one sort of animal that would, in the middle of the night, just screech. And if you weren't aware of what it was about, it would just scare the living daylight side because it was just like, Aah! sounded like someone was hurting it, but that was its cry. It was a night creature on the hunt. And it'd throw out this cry to protect itself. It's how God purposely to protect itself. And we had some friends visiting one time and overheard them when they were in the bedroom. One said, the other says, it sounds like we're in the middle of the jungle. And the other one responded, well, we are. <laughs> but the creatures throughout the world, look at Discovery Channel. Look at, you can just 24-7 just look at different aspects of this world. That's the God who rules this world. These are animated by his authority and power. They exist by his decree. That's what it means to be the chief justice. He determines all things. So God rules his world as the supreme majesty. And that's whose world it is, his world. Secondly, we see here in this portion that God rules the world as the creator and the sustainer, not just the creator. So again, I come back to this point. God did not just create this world and subject it to laws and then stand back and let the world go like those old wind-up clocks. We still have one in our house that's on the wall and it gets <laughs> going real slowly and that tells me that it's time to crank that thing up again. I like the tick of the clock, I like the sound it makes, the chimes, but you got to keep winding it up. And that's how some people perceive this world, that God is set in motion, everything that's going to be, and he steps back, and every once in a while, steps in and kind of cranks it up again and steps back. That is not how God rules his world. In fact, if you look over in Hebrews chapter 1, first of all, he rules this world through his son. John said that there's not anything that's made but was made by him. So even before Christ came into this world, he is the creator of all things and therefore worthy of all the glory. And here in Hebrews chapter 1, it declares him so. Notice how it's put in verse 1 of Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Spoken means revealed. The full manifestation of God and who he is came into his world, not just this world, but his world, in the flesh. Spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world's. I find it interesting that here in Scripture, back in the first century, it doesn't just say made the world, but the worlds. There's already that revelation that this is beyond just this globe that we have here. It's talking about the universe and all that exists out there. 
as a stamp of his infinite glory, who being the brightness of his glory, we say the sun is bright. You look out and you say the sun's shining. I can't actually see the sun, but it's bright. But what is the purpose of the sun? How come it was created in the beginning? To rule the day. So here when it says, who being the brightness of his glory, all that God is in his glory, Christ is that brightness. He is the light. He's the sun. And notice the express image of his person. Today, people want to be politically correct and address their prayers but don't want to offend anybody by praying in Jesus' name. Don't want to offend. Let's just pray in the name of God. Nope. Here it says, he is the express image of his person. And it says, upholding all things. Here it is what I want you to see. Upholding all things by the word of his power. It's not just that he's created the world and turned it loose. He is the creator as we see in, in verse 1 and 2, but he's also the sustainer, upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, here's the point again that we see. If that were not the case, there would be no hope even in trusting in a God who does not rule over all things. Because when you read here, it says, when he had by himself purged our sins. You know what gives me hope in what the scriptures say is to how it is sinners are saved by the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because he directs all things that he's purposed and brings it to that end. It's not me holding him. Just like the creation, the world is upheld in all things by the word of his power. So am I as that sinner saved by grace. It's not me holding him. It's him holding me. And when he had by himself purged our sins, put it away. You look what it says there, sat down. In the Old Testament, there was no chair in the temple or the tabernacle. Those priests were constantly on their feet, working and moving, because the work wasn't done. When Christ came, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own precious blood and laid down his life, ascended on high. How do we know the work is done? Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels. Even the angels are created beings. People getting for all the angels. Who's their creator? That's who we need to know. As he hath by inheritance. He is the heir of all things by God's decree and by, by his very nature as God and the Son of God, but he is the heir of all things also by his finished work, where by his death he obtained a more excellent name than they all and the others. So this is the God who rules the world as the creator and the sustainer. And the scriptures here, coming back to our text, give us these illustrations. It says, who covereth the heaven with clouds. You go out and look up and enjoy a beautiful sky, look at the clouds, but do you ever pause and consider that it's God's hand that is supporting and sustaining those clouds? Stop and think about the density of clouds because they're made up of water. What keeps them up? They're some density to it, and I'm getting well beyond my pay grade here talking about it. But what causes it to float by and what causes it to pour out on the earth? God. That's how he sustained it. We get used to talking about weather reports and these other things if it's, if it's, it's mother nature. Again, there's that humanism where people say, no, God just set the laws in motion and so they talk in those terms. They call it Mother Nature. No. God is very much, even in the clouds and their design. I used to play that game. I still like to look up there and see what you see. There's a puppy laying on its back with feet up in the air. Do you see that? And everybody goes, oh, yeah, I see it. Or here's a duck. All of these things that 
we enjoy, and yet it's God who's even shaping those clouds. But only those can see that that the Lord has taught. The world drives right on by, and we're guilty of it. How many times? We just, we're our heads down, and we're just going and blowing, and many times complaining about the weather. Even that's a rebellion because it's God that sets the temperature. He's the God of this world. And these are reasons that are stated here to praise him, not to complain. There's certain areas of our country where it rains a six months out of the year, and they talk about people going into a depression over it. Do you realize that depression is really suppressed anger? And people wanting something different, expecting something different, and so they become depressed because they are just... One day would love to see the sun. Well, who directs it? It's the Lord. How about asking his will to bow? Because he is, this is his world, by the way. We're tenants. We stay in here just as long as God determines. And when it's time, he's taking us out of here. And the fact, the proof that this is not our world is the fact that we leave it all behind. It says he prepares the rain for the earth by causing it to be taken from the sea, carried by the clouds, and conveyed through the air to places where God purposes. Scriptures talk about God causing it to rain. You got one part of the world over here that's just dying of famine. And then you see over here that it's flooding. And I've heard people say, and perhaps you thought, well, why can't somebody just take some of that rain and bring it over here and have everybody be happy? It's because it's God's world. It's God's rain. Here it says that he prepareth rain for the earth. That word prepare is just as much design as anything as to where it drops. Some of you remember me telling that story one time driving in Haiti up in those mountains, and it was just bleak. We're bouncing around. There's no road. I'm in this little four-wheel drive Jeep hanging on for dear life. The driver seemed to know where he was going. and I'm thinking, how much longer? And he points out over three or four more mountains, that's where we're headed. And I thought, we'll never get there. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, we turn on one of these little turns, and I look, and here's the most beautiful flower that was growing out of a crevice, out of a rock. And there it was in the middle of nowhere. And I remember thinking, God put it there for me. I enjoyed the beauty of it for a time. It refreshed my spirit as we then banged on down the road and dirt and all that carrying on. I thought, that's for me. God does all things for his glory. There's, there's no other reason why there should be a flower out here in the middle of nowhere where no people are around, but God purposed it. And that's what he did. Notice here, too, it says, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. I like that word because it's God making the grass grow. It's not man. There's no seed sown. No one got up there on the mountain and sowed the seed. God did it. So these are examples of how he rules his world as the creator and the sustainer. It says in verse 9, he giveth to the beast his food. Here again is a picture. There's no food distribution program for animals. I know farmers get up and they feed them, but you think about all the wild beasts. When it says beasts here, it's talking about how about all those animals out there that no one even provides for, and yet they are fed. They're God's animal. And here it says in verse 9, even to the young ravens which cry. Talk about ravens, those are the dirty birds. But even them the Lord provides. And stop and think about who we are as sinners. His providing for us is not conditioned upon our merit. We're sinners. We deserve nothing but starvation and, and death. And when we see that in the news, I know some people react, well, how could God do this? We don't deserve any better. 
That whole notion that somehow we do deserve better is, again, that evidence of blindness as to who we are. What it is, is God being merciful in most cases. And I look around and look at myself. He, we, we receive far more than what we ever deserve. So even to complain is, is an evidence of that rebellion that's still in these hearts, to think that somehow we deserve better. It says he delighteth in verse 10, not in the strength of the horse. These are all things that are about us in this world. I know you can argue perhaps which animal represents the, the best of God's creatures. I'm always amazed in watching a horse and how it moves. And especially in slow motion, watching it gallop. Back in the day, that was the prime creature because they used it to go into battle. In fact, in some places over in Afghanistan, even with our modern warfare, there are places that the only play, way to get back in there is on a horse. And those horses are trained to go over terrain and into areas that man could never go with his machines. I think that's a fantastic thing when you stop and consider the strength and power of the horse. But here, it says that God doesn't even delight in the strength of a horse and even much less in the strength of a man. It says in the legs of a man, verse 10, he taketh not pleasure. Well, that does away in one fell swoop with this whole notion of somehow God would really like to do something for you, but he's waiting for you to take the first step. Quote this next time you see that God doesn't even take pleasure in the legs of a man. In fact, he can take them out as quickly as what a man can stand on them if he wills. Let's don't even put confidence in these legs. Because <laughs> the day may come where they're not even strong enough to uphold us. And all the Lord has to do is turn one little thing in our bodies. And the next thing you know, we're, we're invalid. Now, he is the one that directs all things. Thank him every day for what he does. But to wrap this up in verse 11, because our time's about gone, and this is, to me, one of the most vital points here, how God rules the world. God rules his world as the savior of his people. And everything that's going on, and God directing all things, sustaining all things by the word of his power, Here's the amazing thing in verse 11. It says, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Now, don't get this backward, because some, again, will say, now, here's God. He really is looking for somebody to fear him and hope in his mercy. That's not what it says. The very first part of this verse has to do with the Lord taking pleasure. You know what that word pleasure means? To do his will in them that fear him. So think of it this way. You find any that truly fear the Lord. It's the Lord that took pleasure in them. That's why they fear him. If you find any sinners that hope in his mercy, it's the Lord that took pleasure in them that they should hope in his mercy. Else they would be just like the beasts of the field, living and dying without any hope. Don't get that backward. It's like over here in John chapter 1. And we'll have to stop here. But John chapter 1. People read the scriptures backward. Because they've not been taught of the spirit. It's like John 1 12. It says as many as received him. And people get all excited about that. They say ah you see. It says there you have to receive it. But read on, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the authority to become the sons of God. What it's saying is, this is why they received him. Because the authority and power was given them. Else they would not have received him. They would be just like these in verse 11. They came on his own, his own received or not. It's talking about the Jews. But as many as did receive him, what made the difference? Who made it be different? The power 
That's the same word used over there in Hebrews chapter 1. He sustains all things by the word of his power to become the sons of God. There's no true son of God that has taken the glory in anything with regard to their salvation. It says, even to them that believe on his name. They're believing on his name is the evidence and proof that God purposed it. That's his good pleasure. And that's how he rules this world. There are his people. There's that remnant. There's that election according to grace that in all things God is directing this world for the honor and glory of his son and those for whom he paid the sin debt. I'm going to leave it there. And Lord willing, we'll pick up with this next time. We'll meet back here in a few minutes.